What is good, everybody? Welcome one and all to Theron Talks Comics Friday Pod, a one-sided chat about new issues, upcoming issues, solicits, and a bunch of random thoughts. And this is three in a row. If I didn't know better, I'd think I was finally getting my stuff together. If you're finding this on your podcast services, please consider hopping over to Theron Reads Comics on Substack for additional reviews and articles. Feel free to check out anything of mine that I shamelessly promote. But, you know, after we've spent this precious time together. No matter where you're listening to this, you can always find me on Twitter, Blue Sky, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram as Theron Reads Comics or at Theron's Comics. And if you like what I'm doing here, wow, a subscribe, a share, and a comment are great ways to support uh, the reviews and the page. Last episode, I said I was going to touch on the X-Books every week as we close in on the end of the Krakoa era. But this week, I'm going to pivot to Peach Momoko's Ultimate X-Men number one, a fantastic comic. Absolutely fantastic. By far the most creative Ultimate title yet, and biggest departure from the 616 universe, and a whole different way of looking at mutants and the X-Men. Spoilers for a little more than half of the issue follow, So if you haven't read the book and want to, pause this, check it out, and then come back. Like, really, come back. Uh, The main character in Ultimate X-Men number one is a girl named Hisako Ishiki. Hisako, of course, is the mutant called Armor in the 616 universe. Right away, the issue presents us with the idea that Hisako suffers from depression, Now, this comment is made by fellow students as they make fun of her, so it's unclear if that's a trustworthy statement, and thus she suffers from that condition, or if she, um, or if the other students are exaggerating to be cruel, and she's simply going through a temporary mental distress, for reasons we'll find out. Um, A note leads Hisako to visit a temple in the woods behind her school, and it's there that she encounters a shadowy figure. He speaks to her about her friend, Subasa, who died, committing suicide after a struggle with his mental health that no one knew about. The shadowy figure blames Hisako for contributing to his death by not knowing that her friend was struggling and not helping him. Distressed by this, Hisako flees the temple, and on her way she crosses a street without looking. Right before a car hits her, Hisako is enveloped by what appears to be a massive suit of armor, several times larger than herself. The front of the car is crushed, Hisako survives, the suit of armor turns and waves at her before vanishing. We know very little so far about how mutants will function in this universe. One thing that's similar is that Hisako's power manifested in a moment of high stress, which is sometimes connected to how mutant powers manifest in the 616 universe. But wrapped up in this stress is a serious look at mental health. Hisako may or may not be actually depressed, but she is clearly struggling through very difficult emotions. Her friend Tsubasa killed himself. Mental health and suicide are major concerns in Japan. The country has a very high suicide rate, and there are also stigmas connected to mental health, which make seeking treatment very difficult. It will be interesting to see if Momoko links these mental health concerns to mutation, given that the series is, at least for now, set in a Japanese analog. And by that, I don't mean that mutation is a byproduct or otherwise directly connected to mental illness, but that this society's response to mutation somehow mirrors Japan's attitude on mental health. Something particularly noteworthy is that Hisako's armor, if you will, seems to be an entity unto itself. It reacts to her, and as a physical construct, it doesn't merely follow her movements. It seems to either act independently or perhaps act in concert with feelings Hisako might have but is not expressing physically. The last part is entirely speculation, but a sequence at the end of the issue might point in that direction. Uh, Momoko's art is sometimes described simply as manga, or heavily influenced by manga, and it's true that most of her inspiration comes primarily from Japanese references, but it ranges from multiple movie genres, different styles of music, folk art, and even ad design. However, prior to living in the United States, she found value in the style of American comic books as well, and less so in Japanese styles. So Momoko brings a wide variety of backgrounds to her art. It's also not surprising that Momoko would focus primarily, at least for now, 
on Hisako. She has a history of being drawn to female characters as well as consideration of adolescence real life problems. Hisako is a very emotive character. Much of this comes through her eyes, but Momoko expresses a lot of feelings through her whole face with relatively conservative use of lines and shading. She also pays very close attention to body language from a visual perspective. It would not be surprising if Hisako is suffering from depression or real mental distress, as she is very closed off, her arms often held close to her, her posture hunched in, and so forth. Hisako's armor is clearly inspired by samurai design. Samurai are another focus of much of her work. In the modern West, samurai are sometimes associated with general ideas of power, bravery, and honor. Whether or not those sentiments are intentional in Momoko's design for Hisako's armor, it wouldn't be surprising for readers to read those qualities into it, especially given Hisako's emotional state in this issue. The watercolor work is particularly impressive, but perhaps mostly for when Momoko chooses to go darker or brighter, contrasting them. There are multiple sequences that are primarily grays and darker blues that simply feel cold, and these correspond to the issue's darkest moments, uh, creating a very emotional um, response in those scenes. Lanham's lettering is noteworthy for basically staying out of the way of Momoko's art. In most cases, dialogue bubbles and captions are along the perimeter of panels, and it really focuses the eye on the artwork. It's safe to say that Ultimate X-Men will not be for everybody, and where as readers can find a lot of thematic and even story similarities between the other two Ultimate series and their 616 counterparts, this series seems primed to go in completely different directions, if this issue is any indication. As far as Marvel's comics go, I would consider this a big risk. I am often critical of Mar Marvel for seeming to play it safe in terms of the characters they feature, the stories they tell, the series they put out, and how experimental they are with art. Ultimate X-Men number one defies all of those criticisms. And for that reason, I would suggest to everyone, even the most skeptical, to pick this issue up, give it a shot. There are interesting themes and compelling ideas, and the potential for a truly unique vision for mutants in any Marvel Universe. With the Ultimate X-Men number review out of the way, I want to hit on a few ideas before I head out the door. Uh, an image advertising Uncanny X-Men number 700 came out this week. I'm definitely in beating a dead horse territory when it comes to criticizing Marvel's numbering system and how they managed to manipulate those numbers to wring as many high-dollar, extra-sized issues out of it as possible. Using issues of X-Men during a time period when not using Uncanny on a series seemed very deliberate, this is damn cynical. On the off chance you're listening to this and did not check out Blue Beetle number seven this week, I highly encourage you to give it a look. It's the Keith Giffen tribute issue. The very large creative team balanced a tribute with telling a coherent story, and there's a lot to smile at in there. I didn't put out a review for it, but Thanos number four was a fascinating rumination on the inevitability and necessary acceptance of death. This Thanos series brings a lot of metaphysical and existential ideas to the table. If you're looking for a superhero comic that really has something interesting to say, I highly recommend it. I am less enthused, though, about the final issue's promise that Thanos will return in 2024. I don't want Thanos to return. Give him the lion's share of the decade off. Too often his return means infinity baubles, and those things just need to be chucked down a cosmic garbage disposal, if you ask me. Um, the Hollywood Reporter this week had an article about an upcoming series from Kieran Gillen and Casper Wingard, maybe? I might have butchered the last name. It features, per the article, superpowered beings with the destructive capabilities of America's nuclear arsenal. It's also said to sit somewhere between the aesthetics of subversive works such as The Boys and Watchmen. From other things Gillen says in the article, it's a near certainty that this is X-Men inspired, um, and it's out from Image in August. I will be very curious about that one. The books I'm most looking forward to next week are Symbiote Spider-Man 2099 number one. Hard to beat Peter David coming back to the character he kicked so much ass with in the 90s. And Napalm Lullaby from Image. 
I am considerably less excited for the X titles for reasons that I continue to outline, but, you know, engagement. Um, a note on my own review system. You may have noticed that this week I put out uh, four full-length reviews plus uh, the Ultimate X-Men review on this podcast and fewer mini-reviews that feature on Twitter and in the review roundup. I'm going to try to continue to focus on a larger number of full reviews and podcast reviews, at least when I have significant things to say about uh, the issues. This might result in fewer mini-reviews, and I might start putting some of those mini-reviews only on the review roundup. Social media engagement be damned. And with Amazing Spider-Man number 45, which is billed as a bit of an aftermath book coming out this week, I should have a complete Gang War podcast coming soon. I think I mentioned it on Twitter, and there was some uh, response positive to that coming And that does it this week. Thanks for giving me some of your time today. As always, feel free to drop a comment, regardless of whether you think I'm spot on or totally crazy. Find me on all the social media, as I mentioned earlier. And until next time, peace out.